Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to this Global Child Forum uh, event, uh, which is looking at the state of children's rights and business in Southeast Asia. Uh, and specifically, we are launching the Southeast Asia uh, uh, benchmark. Uh, my name is Richard Welford. I'm a senior advisor at Elevate. Uh, Elevate is a global sustainability consulting and assessment firm with a lot of emphasis on labor rights, human rights, and as a subset of that, of course, uh, children's rights as well. Um, I I'm really happy to be moderating this event this afternoon because we've worked with the Global Child Forum over a number of years, and it's a, a great uh, pleasure to be uh, meeting again with my colleagues at the Global Child uh, Forum uh, as well. So the, the aim of this afternoon's session uh, is to explain and go into the findings of the Southeast Asia Benchmark Report uh, and look at what it means to be taking children's rights seriously, uh, with an emphasis, of course, on what businesses uh, can and, 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 and should be doing. So the rundown is quite straightforward. Um, after a brief introduction in a minute, we'll have a presentation uh, of the benchmark itself, uh, how it was designed and what the findings were. Uh, and then we're going to have some reflections on what that means specifically for business from two practitioners uh, from leading Southeast Asian uh, uh, companies. Um, there'll be opportunities for you to ask questions. Uh, and all you need to do is type your questions into the chat box. I'm sure everyone is used to that now, uh, and uh, I'll pick up those questions and we'll try and ask as many as, 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 as possible. But first, I want to kick off and I want to um, introduce to you Kaiser Viking, who is the Secretary General of the Global Child Forum, to say a, a few words of welcome and opening. Kaiser. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, from a very sunny but cold and crispy Stockholm this morning. Uh, I want to welcome you all to today's event and the launch of the Global Child Forum's Southeast Asian Benchmark Report. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Global Child Forum, um, we are a foundation that was started by the Swedish royal couple a little over 10 years ago with the purpose of inspiring the corporate sector to create a better world for children. And over the last 10 years, we have gathered thousands of business leaders at our forums, and we've also produced case studies, deep dives, tools, and other services in order to support companies in addressing children's rights in, in their operations and in their communities. We also know that data, and more specifically, insights from data, help to drive change for real action. So in collaboration with Boston Consulting Group, we have benchmarked more than 2,600 global companies. And today's benchmark that we're going to talk about marks our 13th study. So we pride ourselves in saying that we produce the world's largest benchmark on children's rights and business. And during this year, 2021, uh, we will benchmark another 850 global companies uh, with an additional focus on the tech and telecom sector. And you can find all of our, web, all of our uh, benchmarks on our website if you want to have more information. So after nearly a decade of benchmarking companies, we're able to articulate some of the key indicators that drive corporate success both in terms of financial performance and social contribution. Uh, we have actually uh, recently conducted a correlation study together with Boston Consulting Group that shows that those companies who are what we call leaders on child rights also show a correlation with higher profitability. So the benchmark that we're launching today, the state of children's rights and business in Southeast Asia, covers 232 of the largest publicly listed companies across eight different sectors in Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. 
And that represents approximately 70% of the total revenues generated in that region. And what we do is we review publicly available information, uh, in, in this case, uh, as of June 2020, such as sustainability reports, uh, websites, published policies, etc. And the methodology uses 27 indicators across different children's rights issues, but they're all building on the existing frameworks, such as the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, the UN Guiding Principles on Human Rights, and specifically um, the Children's Rights and Business Principles that were created by, say, the Children, UN Global Compact, and UNICEF. And that one puts a child's rights perspective on the UN Guiding Principles. So now for the good news um, and a, a bit of a drum roll. Since our last benchmark in this region in 2016, we do see that Southeast Asia has improved and made significant stride. Um, and more and more companies bring children's rights to the board level, which is very positive. And although the region has made a uh, great headway, uh, there is still much room and a great need for improvement. Half of the companies in the region don't have a child labor policy. And with the year of the elimination of child labor upon us, as mandated by, by UN General Assembly, there's really no better time than now to close the child labor policy gap in this region. And there is also concern, as many of you know, that this global pandemic risks undermining a lot of the, the positive strides that has been made, or worse, even, even reversing progress that has been made over the past decade. So that's why we're all here today, um, to better understand how we can use this data that you will be presented today and transform it into real action. So I will hand over to you, Richard, and uh, to my colleague, Nina Falmer, to talk more about the results and the study. Thank you very much for attending today. Okay, thank you very much, Kaiser. That's, I think that's very, very useful background uh, for people who may not be aware of uh, what Global Child Forum has been doing. And I'm going to move swiftly on now to talk about the benchmark itself by introducing two people uh, to you. Firstly, Nina Fulmer, who is a research manager at the Global Child Forum. Uh, and secondly, Alexis Linda, who is, who is a project manager at the Boston Consulting Group, who has been working on this project uh, as, uh, as well. Um, as, as I said before, if you have any questions as we go along, please type them into the chat box and I'll hand over to you, Nina. Thank you very much, Richard. Very happy to be here to share our results that we've been working on for over a year uh, with our colleagues and uh, Alexis' team. Just try and share my screen now while I talk. You can see if I can manage that. I am not one for, um, let's see, there you should be able to. Can you just confirm, Richard, that you can see it because I can't see you anymore? We can see you. Perfect. So, um, I would just dive straight into it and pick up where uh, Kaiser left off, uh, explaining a little bit more about the methodology and the study. As Kaiser said, we have 27 indicators based on a wide array of children's rights uh, issues that sort of span across uh, business activities. And we divide these into three what we call impact areas which are the workplace, which basically covers own operations and supply chains and issues such as child labor, family friendly policies um, and the marketplace, which covers uh, issues around product and market marketing. Um, and finally, the community environment, which focuses more on the indirect impacts on children in communities and their environment uh, as a result from company activities. We look at information from publicly available information from companies to assess uh, these areas across the 27 indicators and we score uh, on a scale from 0 to 10. Uh, so each indicator can receive a 0, 5 or a 10 where 0 means that we haven't found any information. 5 means that we have uh, found reporting where, that covers what is in the indicator but it's generally on sustainability and human rights. And for a score of 10, 
we see that there is reporting that covers the issue and mentions children specifically. Then we uh, calculate each uh, indicator score into a weighted impact area score. So you get a score for each of these impact areas. And they are then in turn calculated into weighted average score. So all information about how this weighting is done and each individual indicator you can find uh, on the benchmark report page in the full methodology. Um, I should also say that we send the results to all companies that are part of the study. Um, you can't choose whether you want to be in or out, we choose that, but we make sure that we give everybody the opportunity to uh, comment and give feedback on the results to ensure that they are as correct as possible. Um, I will hand over to you, Alexis, to talk more about the results here. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, the uh, <clears throat> companies are scored individually, but they are then aggregated up into an industry average score. And as we've seen for the Southeast Asia, um, <clears throat> the, the scores range from 4.8, with the highest being in food and beverage and personal care. And the, low, the lowest be, excuse me, <clears throat> and the lowest being 3.4 for apparel and retail. Also, travel and leisure is 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 quite high on on this scale. So this is still uh, leaves a lot of room for improvement because the between around 2.5 to 5 is the score we set for a for an improver with uh, above that being an achiever or a, or that and then a leader so this still leaves significant room for improvement with the region but as we will see in the next slide in a, in a, in a short moment uh, the trend is still very much in the right direction um, there's a large spread within the se several of these um, industries as well so if we look in the food uh, beverage and, and personal care uh, industry that uh, has a lot of the, the a, a large share of the leaders in the in the region. <clears throat> they also have a lot of the laggards uh, as well. So so both the food and beverage and personal care and the, especially also the, the telecom and, and tech industries show a, a very big variety in outcomes. In the tech and telecom side, it's also driven a lot about uh, by the uh, telecom companies being uh, to a higher degree uh, achievers and leaders. Uh, whilst the uh, the tech piece, so electronics and so on and so forth, being more on the laggard end, we see many of the of the really strong performers uh, on the um, on the food and beverage side being in the in the agriculture sector. So we have uh, Vilmar International, which are a, a case study in the report that you can read as well, uh, with a very high like a nine point four score on our on our ten grade uh, weighted average. Uh, maximum, uh, but others like Sim Darby Plantation, IOI, which we will listen to in a while as, uh, as well, uh, uh, Olam International and Sharon Pokwan as well, Foods. And on the telecom side, we see uh, high performers such as Singapore Telecom uh, Telecommunications and the True Corp Public Company and Star Hub. So, why are some companies successful, more successful than others? <clears throat> So we see a couple of trends here, or a couple of themes here, rather. So a lot of the, the industries that have products that are close to children um, are, are, tend to be more successful than, than others. So that, for example, is food, which obviously is, is, is an important piece of, uh, is very important to families and their children. Uh, but we also see that the consumer, so the marketplace, has a very big piece here as well, right? So products that have a history of, of uh, consumer pressure through the supply chain or, 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 or from consumers tend to perform better as well. So a good example here is, uh, as we mentioned, there are many strong companies in the, in the agri-produce industry. And that's driven by the fact that it's an industry that has a history of, of issues with child labor, environmental issues, uh, hazardous environment, and so on and so forth, which has actually driven the industry to, to be much more proactive and aggressive in these issues. 
Um, on the other side, we see that uh, apparel and retail is a big laggard, which is also a consumer facing industry. So how, how is that possible? So what we believe here is that the apparel and retail industry in the Southeast Asia is a very, it's a fairly localized and regional industry, which doesn't have the, the, the global demands in the same way the food industry has. Um, compare, um, which if you compare it perhaps to Europe, for example, where the apparel and retail industry scores higher because the local consumers there are more aggressive. So I think we can flip to the next slide. But as I mentioned, we have seen improvement across the board uh, since uh, 2016. So, uh, uh, some might notice that the numbers here aren't exactly the same as on the previous page and the, the reason for that is that the, the methodology has improved significantly over the years that, uh, that we've been using for the benchmark. So what we've done here is that we've actually taken the 2020 data set, the news data set, and adjusting it, the score using the 2016 methodology to get a comparable, um, to get a comparable data set. And what we see is a improvement across, so here nine is the top score, not 10. Um, and, and we see here an improvement uh, across the board, but a very big discrepancy across the industries. So as mentioned here, still uh, food, beverage and personal care is not only the leader, but also the, the vast improver. Um, important to note here is that the, tel the technology and telco uh, sample here is not the overlap is not very big, so there's actually not a lot of the same companies in the 2016 and 2020, but we do see that the, comp the telco companies that are in, this, uh, in the sample that actually do turn up of 2016 and 2020 actually have been very strong improvers, which is nice to see. Uh, despite this, the, the, the score by, by our global benchmark standard is still fairly low, so we still see that there's a lot of room of, uh, for improvement uh, compared to some other regions in the world. But, but as Kaisa mentioned up top, the good news are that we're moving aggressively in the right direction. Um, and as we will hear from IOI in a while, there are some, uh, for example, there are some cases of IOI that have in the food and beverage uh, uh, sector palm oil, olive, uh, oil here that has gone from a score of two to a score of nine so from a beginner score to, a, to an absolute leader score so there are some really strong uh, some, some really fast movers also we've seen in basic materials that there has been um, quite a lot of improvement so the main areas of improvement, uh, the main drivers of the improvement has been in child labor policies. So a lot of more companies now have commitments and policies uh, surrounding child labor. And we also see, as, as was mentioned up front as well, that, that there has been a, a, a really big shift in bringing uh, child labor policies into the boardroom, making it a, a, a board accountability a part of the governance structure for these issues and also including these issues in the materi materiality analysis. We do see a gap that companies need to co collaborate more. So compared to other regions, we see that companies are less active uh, in working together with NGOs to, in order to improve their, uh, their processes. So, you can, uh, so this is just a, just a very, very narrow picking of, of, of a much broader piece of work we have in the report. So feel free to visit both the methodology this in the in the in the uh, on the web page but also to read the full report to get a much more exhaustive uh, uh, analysis and and, and uh, uh, overview of, of the results thank you thanks alexis so i want to dive a little bit deeper into some of the areas that alexis mentioned here and i also just want to take the opportunity to say that for each of these sectors that Alexis talked about, there is a scorecard in the report, so you can read much more detail about each of the sectors, uh, the leaders and the be best improvers since 2016 for each of these sectors. Um, so we have looked at uh, what the top, top scoring companies are doing um, in comparison to those who receive a lower score. 
And what we see is, as Alexis said, that many of the top scores, they uh, can be found within the food and beverage sector and within telecommunications, such as IOI and Sintel that we will hear more from later, but there are other examples too. So what are they doing that others aren't? Um, so we see, for example, that uh, as Kaisa mentioned, almost half of the companies in the region don't have a child labor policy. So the high scoring companies, they don't only have a child labor policy, but they also sort of drive that home. So for those that have a child labor policy, they also uh, show that it is a material issue, um, which presumably also gives it more resource and more attention within the company. And on top of that, we see that the board is involved either through sort of being responsible for receiving uh, reporting on compliance and non-compliance um, or having sort of committees over viewing these issues in a very sort of operational way. Um, what we see then when we speak to companies that do this, um, they lower their risk, right? So by addressing this issue, um, they don't only lower risk to the company, but can also sort of proudly say that we want to be part of the solution rather than the problem. And by addressing these issues, even if you think maybe it's not a big thing, uh, being caught in a child labor scandal can be devastating, which we have several examples of uh, in different case studies that we have done over the years. So when you have these measures in place, you, you are less likely to be caught unaware uh, of such a scandal sort of being part of, um, of that. And you're also more prepared to work actively in a preemptive manner rather than a reactive manner. The second part that we see that high scoring companies are doing well is as Alexis was also mentioning, is collaboration. So when we look at collaboration, we look at two parts. One is the NGO collaboration or charity collaboration where companies partner up with or donate to uh, organizations to improve children's lives um, or contribute. And the other part is when you collaborate with other stakeholders such as government, industry organizations, universities, and so on that are either peers uh, or experts. And we see that 44% um, of companies in, in the study uh, do collaborate with uh, child rights organizations, as in the first example, whereas only 25% collaborate with other stakeholders. So those who do, and when we talk to them about why, it's about solving problems that are bigger than themselves. So many of the issues that surround children are not something that you can take on as a single company. So by collaborating with others, you pool the expertise and you get better use for the resources that you invest and you ensure better impact uh, for what you want to achieve. And examples of this include working with government or community organizations to increase access and quality of education or healthcare including vocational training for youth. Another example of working with universities is um, CPF, which is featured as a case study in the report that worked with the university on a nutrition program for children to ensure that it was uh, correctly devised. Um, and another example is travel and leisure companies who sign up for an industry code that is uh, set up together with NGOs that is called the code that uh, handles or is against sexual, child sexual exploitation in the travel and leisure industry. Um, and we find that this is a particularly important because one of the things that Southeast Asian companies are doing very well is having programs uh, for children. So over 80% of companies have programs to benefit children in some way. Uh, particularly within education and healthcare. And by collaborating with others on these programs, the effect of, and the impact of them could be much greater. And moving on to um, some of the opportunities that we find across industries, we have some high scorers that do well on this, but 
generally, when we look at the marketplace, which if you remember when I presented the methodologies about marketing and products and how they impact children in different ways. So what we see that almost all can improve on is uh, the responsible marketing part and product safety. So in the study, only 3% of companies have a policy on responsible marketing or product safety. This is remarkably low, um, but it also follows the global pattern. So for the global study that we did in 2019, the numbers are slightly higher, but not much. And this is something that companies often think is not relevant for them because they don't have uh, products or marketing that is directed towards children. But children are also part of society and uh, they receive basically all the same marketing messages that adults do and uh, they also come in contact with the same products. Uh, and children are more vulnerable to the both in terms of what products can be uh, unsafe for them but also marketing messages that might be appropriate. So there is a need to think about children when you think about marketing and product in general. And when we talk to companies that do have um, these kinds of measures in place, they, they often tell us that it is out of a risk mitigation perspective, that they don't want to be involved in anything bad uh, when it comes to children and the products or the marketing. Of course, you don't want to do that, but I think there is a great missed opportunity here um, for companies in this area because it's not only about minimizing your risk, uh, there's also market opportunity. And there's a resource efficiency argument. Um, so for example, by looking at possibilities for positive messaging through your marketing, uh, a company can contribute to changing harmful or negative attitudes or stereotypes. Uh, for example, a beauty company that shows different skin tones and body types, uh, they increase the range of what is perceived as normal. It might seem as a small thing to do, but many small things can create big change. And to add to that, we also, a recent study that I read is, is said that children who are on Instagram, and we talk about children, we talk about youth up to 18 years old, so it's quite a wide span. Uh, they receive about seven uh, commercial messages per minute on the uh, Instagram stream. So you sort of imagine the amount of marketing messages that children digest every day. Uh, when it comes to product safety, sorry, um, we see that particularly the telecom industry has a lot of great examples around this, where even though maybe many of their products are not meant for children, they have come to realize that children are using them. And I know that Singtel, for example, has a great program that we might be able to hear a little bit more about. And when you use children as the benchmark for safety, but if your product is safe for a child to use, it's probably safe for anybody else. So if you sort of take that as your, your primary perspective, you save resources in terms of other uh, safety measures. So with that, um, I want to thank you for your attention and hope that you stay on to listen to uh, the, the the panel and encourage you to read the report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nina, and uh, thank you, Alexis, uh, as as well. Um, I've got time to pop it pop a couple of questions to you. Um, Kaiser, in her opening, talked about a positive correlation between scores and profitability. But there's another correlation in your report that I'd quite like to explore, and that is that you find a correlation between receiving a higher average score in your benchmark and being involved in human rights violations. So how come people scoring more highly are more likely to be involved in human rights violations? Do. Maybe I can start on that one and Alexis, you can fill in. Um, so that's, that's absolutely correct. That is a finding that we, uh, that is in the report. And as you say, it might sort of first seem intuitively sort of wrong. If you receive a high score, shouldn't you be better at this? Uh, but I think what we need to understand is that we, we look at public reporting, right? 
So we don't necessarily measure the actual impact. So that's the first thing. And a company that has been in some kind of a scandal or has received heat for being in any of these sort of violation allegations tend to report more on it or be, become more actively engaged in the issue. Um, what we see when we also speak to companies is that it's not only sort of whitewashing and reporting more, but the reporting comes from a place of actually also trying to do more. So you don't report normally. I mean, there might be examples, but normally you don't report on some, such a sensitive issue without have actually being able to back it up. So there's like a time lag between the, the violations that are coming and are reported and the reporting that we uh, capture in, in our benchmark. So that, that's the explanation that we can find. Uh, but it is something you, that, um, that is really interesting and needs to be talked about a lot more. So in a way you can essentially see it as a positive feedback loop almost that you had a bad experience um, and maybe you got hit for having a bad experience. So you improve your structure and your transparency, but also you improve your reporting, not just putting policies in place, but you improve your reporting. And that might even cause you in the future to be more open if you identify in your supply chain some transgression against your policies or whatever. So it actually can be quite intuitive when you think about it the second round. Okay, I get that. Um, let, me, let me ask you another question about scores. Um, you know, we've got some companies actually now scoring very highly uh, on this benchmark in, in Asia, which is great to see. We've got quite a few companies who are not doing so well, though, and have actually got rather, rather poor scores uh, in actual fact. So let's, uh, let's address those companies with the poor scores. Um, what recommendations do you have for those companies uh, in order to get them a higher score next time? I mean, a super quick one, if you have a really low score, you probably even don't have the policies and commitments in place, right? So there's a lot of, I don't want to use the word tick the box activities, but there's a lot of foundational activities in just putting the policies and, and commitments in place that it's not easy, but the easier part. So that's like a big, a beginning step, I think. But there's a huge amount of things you have to do then to, to move from that to even further. And I, you know, maybe then I have some additional <laughs> uh, recommendations there. Sure, I might just want to add that uh, the last section in the report actually has four very concrete recommendations that looks at sort of what are the best companies doing and what are the benefits they see from that. Um, and some tips about resources that you can use to understand better and sort of get started on, on that journey. Um, but I agree with Alexis, sort of get your foundations first um, and sort of start building. You don't have to have everything perfect from mm. the get-go. It is a journey. Yes, absolutely. You're not going to become perfect overnight and uh, we need to recognize that, uh, I, I, I think. Okay, I'm going to move on because I'm a little bit conscious of the time. Nina will come back and join us in the panel discussion in a little while. But for now, thank you, Nina, and thank you, Alexis. That was a nice, succinct summary and I would also encourage people to read the report uh, as, as well. Okay, so we're going to move on to the second half of, of, of our session, um, which is to get some input from two practitioners from two leading companies in Asia, uh, and then get them to have a short sort of introduction uh, about their business and children's rights, and then we'll have a panel discussion where we can uh, raise some other questions from myself, but also hopefully uh, from you as, as, as well. Um, so I, I, I first want to introduce uh, Andrew Bry, who is Vice President for Group Sustainability at Singtel, but also he's based in Sydney with Optus, where he's also an Optus talent coach uh, as, uh, as well. Andrew and I have also known each other for a number of years now, so it's uh, great to be seeing you online, if not in person, Andrew. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. And uh, again, you know, great to be connected with yourself. As you mentioned, we haven't seen each other for quite a while. And also thank you to the Global Child Forum for giving me this opportunity to just share a bit more about what we do. So maybe just very briefly as an introduction, you know, one of the things we undertake as a company uh, every couple of years is what we call a formal stakeholder engagement uh, process 
to just try and identify what are all the natural issues that as a company, our stakeholders expect us to address or could represent the issues or opportunities. And very early on, you know, as we undertook a, uh, one of our early stakeholder engagement exercises in 2014, uh, what became quite apparent as we engaged into you know, regulators, into parents, into our own staff base, into the community organizations, and even into schools, that you know, while the, the nature of the telco industry has had a lot of very positive benefits you know, for remote learning and education and digital inclusion and access to information, one of the things that was a growing concern at the time was the unintended consequences of our industry. We were hearing about concerns around issues of cyber, cyber wellness, you know, mental health issues with youth who may have device addiction or are subject to cyber bullying, uh, issues around data privacy and data protection, you know, for uh, children and youth who are not so well attuned to what are the risks of operating in a very digital world. And it was off the basis of some of these insights that we started to develop uh, quite comprehensive programs uh, in what we call digital safety and online safety and cyber wellness and inclusion, uh, which involved everything from programs in schools with teachers, with parents, uh, even developing resource tools for teachers to use uh, in uh, conducting lessons even for children with special needs uh, in online safety and uh, you know working with the business to develop products and services to provide a greater level of protection and uh, also even setting up working with the government to set up national hotlines for cyber help counseling cyber wellness counseling because uh, traditional uh, helplines and counseling hotlines didn't know how to deal with uh, the issues of uh, challenges in the digital world. So this is just examples of the program that we uh, launched very early in 2013-2014 in Singapore and Australia and subsequently our associates across the region uh, have similarly uh, adopted them. So we continue to build on them. There are quite a few areas we uh, identify as both gaps as well as opportunities, because when you deal with a segment such as children, it's actually a very broad spectrum. You have to deal with across the supply chain or value chain as indirect customers uh, and children as just members of, of parents who work for us. Uh, and there are quite a few areas we continue to put an effort and a focus on, even while you know, we're appreciative to be recognized for the good work that we've done so far. So thank you, Richard, and I'm very happy to take questions later on in the panel discussions. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks for being so succinct. So don't go away. We'll grab you back again in five minutes to join in with the panel. Um, but I want to now hear from actually a very, very different industry. Um, Andrew talked about technology a lot. And um, now we're moving to plantations, uh, which are less technical and have a lot, a lot of labor issues, of course. So I want to introduce you to Dr. Serena Binti Ismail. Uh, who is the Group Head of Sustainability for IOI Corporation based in Malaysia. Uh, Serena. Good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So um, thank you very much. I would like to thank as well the Global Child Forum for uh, inviting me to share our experience. I think what I'll do is I'll share my screen. Um, so that I can present to you. Um, is, is, is this on show now? All right, great. Um, let me just put this on slide. And, um, okay, so I think it's important to share with you a little background on IOI Corporation and, uh, you know, and show our journey forward. Uh, specifically, IOI is a vertically integrated palm oil um, uh, company uh, with about 30,000 strong, uh, with a land bank of about 207,000 uh, um, uh, hectare of, of land bank. Uh, this is to give you context and the scope of our operation. 
In terms of how do we go forward, um, there was a very interesting question that was given to, uh, by, uh, that, would, that Richard had asked earlier about how do we move forward? And I think the, the first thing that we need to do is to ensure that our, our, our um, basis is strong. So we started out having a sustainability vision that commits ourselves to protect the environment, to ensure economic, social well-being of our employees, as well as to be uh, innovative in, our, in embedding sustainability in our business. We thought that the vision needs to be clear, uh, shared throughout the corporation. And together with that, we understand that the pillars of sustainability, which is people, planet, and prosperity, needs to be in balance together with partnership to enable us to, uh, you know, to illust illustrate, to, to actually uh, implement our vision. And we have three enablers, which is human capital development, sustainability, and technology digi digitalization. So with this as a uh, strong uh, foundation, we went, away, we went ahead to see how we can approach this sustainably. Now that we have defined our sustainability within the IOI group with our sustainability vision, the next step was to engage with stakeholders and not just external stakeholders like uh, our customers, the, end, the civil societies, communities, government agencies, but also importantly with our internal uh, stakeholders because ultimately we need to be able to implement our vision and therefore we need to have our internal stakeholders um, confide with us, tell us what are the issues faced, what are the successes, what are the failures. Now, once we have done that, we set goals and commitments because now we have both the, the feedback from the st stakeholders, external stakeholders, as well as the internal uh, stakeholders. And once we have done that, we need to now see how we can implement it because it's easy to set goals and commitments. The most difficult part is the implementation, Im implementation side. And this is where we establish systems and processes to ensure that what we wanted to uh, articulate can be implemented uh, on the ground. And once this is done, we need to track the progress, monitor it, and then also communicate these actions whether to our stakeholders and see whether this meets expectation. And this is where transparency becomes uh, very important. And also, I think um, it also answers the questions of why for example, those who might uh, uh, you know, share a lot of the information are uh, being transparent are also the one who has seemed to have a lot more issues. And this is because we share clearly the grievances that, that we are facing that, that has been reported to us so that this can, be, this can have accountability. And we, we ensure that this uh, uh, information is going to be, is, can be tracked and can be verified to have been done um, according to, in accordance to what we have committed. Uh, we felt that it was very important for us to um, look into the relevant uh, UN SDGs, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, because we wanted to be in alignment globally. We are, we are a company that works globally and we wanted to make sure that our sustainable development goals are in alignment and we decided to adopt just six of them because uh, you know it's it's there's too many targets and goals in the 17 uh, UN SDGs the ones that are most relevant is zero hunger uh, decent work and economic growth responsible consumption and production climate action life on land and partnership for goals because we believe that this cannot be done without partnership Finally, we thought that it was important to have good governance because in order for the social aspects and the environmental aspects to be addressed, good governance needs to be in place to, to ensure that accountability, accountability of what we are, we are doing and committed are being actually done on the ground. And uh, to this end, we have uh, our group, group managing director who is on the board of directors, uh, which we report to. Uh, together with uh, a steering committee that also reports directly to the board, as well as an external advisory panel to ensure that some part, some of the 
uh, um, commitments that we have done are being uh, committed and, uh, and, and that we are actually ensuring this is being um, uh, done in, in, uh, in accordance to what our commitment are. Uh, in terms of societal aspects, this is where forced labour, no forced labour or child labour uh, are being uh, articulated and this is very much in line with our commitment uh, under IL, uh, that we have for ILO uh, conventions. And this can be shown through all our activities and to be reported uh, transparently. So I think what I'm trying to say is that a lot of the issues that we have found, we need to make sure that this is addressed within the operation. Therefore, sustainability is not separate but it's embedded within the operation. It becomes part and parcel of the operation. So the issue of child labor, for example, how do we address this? We need to make sure that the stakeholder engagement that we have with our employees, with our employees uh, dependent are being addressed. Um, we have made sure that um, issues uh, that needs to have guidelines will be put in place so that all our commitments are being uh, homogeneously applied throughout our operation. So I think this is the main thing that I wanted to talk to you about how we were able to um, address the issue from 2016 to 2020, the, the, the advancement in our sustainability journey. So I will be, I will be uh, uh, you know, very frank with you. There's still a lot of challenges that we are facing, still a lot of suggestions that we would, uh, um, uh, you know, very free to accept, as well as we understand there's still gaps that needs to be addressed. With that, um, I thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Serena. That was that was great. Thank you for the summary. Um, I think we're going to bring back Andrew now, and also um, Nina will rejoin us as well, so that we can have a, a bit of a Q and A session. Uh, and just to remind you who are listening this afternoon, if you have any questions for any or all of our panelists, then please just uh, write them into the uh, into the chat box. Um, but let me kick off with some questions I have for myself. Um, Andrew, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, the last thing Serena said is that she has still has some challenges uh, in, in dealing with, with child rights. And I'm, I'm sure that's the case with, with Singtel um, as, as well. So what, what sort of challenges have you experienced trying to tackle a topic like children's rights? Thanks, Richard. Well, one of the areas, and I think it was alluded to when uh, Nina was sharing a bit of research, right? Uh, for us, children is a bit of an indirect stakeholder. Uh, while, you know, we have them as customers, most times the customer is actually the parent or the family. Um, similarly, while we may have potentially children rights issues from a labor perspective in our supply chain, in, in all likelihood, it's more likely to be in several layers somewhere within our supply chain. So that challenge of not having that direct access to that stakeholder for whether the nature of the business or the privacy issues, etc., uh, actually means we have to engage quite uh, comprehensively and quite widely to try and identify from the direct stakeholders that we do interact, whether they're regulators or you know, as parents or things like that, customers, to be able to identify what the issues are. Uh, so that's, that's one challenge. Um, I suppose a second area is, um, and a bit related to that, you know, we, we can be called the dump pipe, right? The telco. But uh, when uh, children consume social media, without mentioning names, but they consume social media and, or gaming addiction of the broadband or the internet, etc. Uh, the most visible thing the parents see is the mobile device and the computer screen that's connected to the internet. And in a funny sort of way, even though we are sometimes called the dumb pipe uh, and a lot of things goes through, there's actually expectation from our stakeholders that we should tackle these issues, uh, even if we don't have necessarily always direct control or access to, to the issue. But it's given us the opportunity to really look and think a bit more innovatively and creatively uh, to how we try and address the issues. But obviously, there's still a lot more work to be done. Hmm. It, it, it's interesting to hear you talk about innovation and creativity, that it's made you think in that sort of, that sort of way. That's, that's, that's very positive. Um, Serena, 
I'd like to ask you to say a little bit more about plantations because you know you've got Andrew working in a very high tech business. A plantation is the other end of the spectrum. It's it's pretty low tech. It's very very labour intensive. What are some of the sort of child rights issues that we have within plantations or communities around plantations? I think, uh, as I mentioned, there are still some challenges that we are facing. I mean, um, if you look at this, we obviously have workers with children, um, and most of the workers live within the estates. And uh, in that sense, and we want to make sure that the children that lives in the estates are not exposed to child labor. So our challenges are to ensure that we have up-to-date statistics of the number of children within our plantation. That's really important. Because then we can identify uh, whether, you know, these children are actually in schools. Are they, because once the children are generally in schools, then they are not going to be in the plantation. So that's one of the first things that we wanted to do. And we thought that uh, the other part that's important is also uh, looking at the, the parents and convincing the parents that it's important to ensure that the children do not come into the plantation for safety purposes. Um, in, uh, you know, plantation's huge. We have about 500 to about 3,000 hectares, each of the estates. And it's difficult to monitor. Um, generally, the, the issue is still, you know, they might get lost, um, they might, you know, fall, uh, you know, hurt themselves, or they might be in a place where some uh, harvesting are in, 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 uh, in, uh, in action, and then they might get, you know, involved in it. So these are the sort of things that we must, must make sure that the parents are, are convinced that they should keep their children. But again, this is of course, uh, some, you know, it's, they do bring their children sometimes, and we do, for example, know, know that they do this. So we make sure that at least they have some uh, PPEs, you know, uh, personal protection uh, um, equipment. Uh, you know, for example, when they want to bring their children to bring lunch, the parents, for example, that, you know, that sort of things, they bring them along because it might not be, um, you know, feasible for them to leave the kids in the house. So in that event, we do provide, but we do tell them that you need to make sure that it is safe, that they are actually, you know, supervising their own kids because there's no way that we can supervise the kids in the plantation. So that, that sort of things happens, you know, I mean, so we try to make sure that it, it you know, if it happens that they have the kind of protection uh, that they need. Um, the other thing is getting the kids to attend school. Sometimes the parents um, wants the kids to be with them, to help to take care of their family, you know, other siblings, you know, uh, even help them with their own chores. So we try to make sure that this is not the way to do it, give them counseling. So this is some of the challenges that we faced um, in, in doing this. And I think the, the, the important things right now is that we need to monitor, we need to counsel them, we need to give them the facilities in order to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, implement uh, you know, child, child education within the plantation. I mean, and presumably those sorts of things you can't do uh, on your own. So, so I have a question for all three of you uh, about collaboration, which, which Nina talked about already quite a lot, and how you're developing partnerships with, with, with stakeholders. How are you working with other people um, to address some of these, these, these child rights challenges? Uh, shall I start with you, Andrew, and then... Uh, Serena, and then we can hear from Nina as well. Sure. I momentarily lost connection, so thank God I got back in time. But uh, I think collaboration is really important in this space because, you know, again, we don't necessarily deal directly with uh, the child as a stakeholder. So in all our programs, we try and identify who are relevant players in a sense in the ecosystem and actually all our programs uh, have had to forge partnerships. You know, example, when we launched a national hotline, we pioneered it and uh, co-developed the program, but we worked with government and the Singapore National Council of Social Services. You know, we always take the approach of uh, co-developing programs and 
to demonstrate that a solution can work. And one of the success factors normally is when a program works, actually the government or the social service agencies are quite happy to then adopt that after the risk is undertaken. So that's one example. Uh, in other areas of our program, we've even worked with think tanks and uh, research institute. One example is DQ Institute, where we you know, very early pioneered a lot of the digital learning tools and together with them conducted research. And that's an example where working with them and subsequently we've actually been able to establish even a global framework for digital literacy and digital intelligence, which recently was endorsed and approved by IEEE as a global framework of digital literacy. So partnerships are quite critical and uh, it's really about how different partners bring to bear different complementary skill sets to address a particular issue that we're trying to tackle. Okay, so I guess it's my turn now. <laughs> well, you know, um, we have put partnership as part of the uh, way forward because we believe that things cannot be done by ourselves. This is, the issue of children is not just uh, one company, it's not just one sector, it's the whole country, the whole community, the whole country. So what we have done is that we have worked with, for example, for the, the, the children in our uh, plantation, especially children of migrant workers, where they might not be able to have access to the local uh, schools. We have worked with local NGOs called Humana to set up Humana schools and uh, community learning centers. Uh, this is so, so that we would make sure that they do go to school following the syllabus of their country. So that if once they have graduated, they will, be, they will have the opportunity to go back to the country, for example, and still continue on forward. So this is a really important aspect that we think is important. The other, the other part that is important is that we need to make sure that we work with the, with the government, the state government and the, uh, and the federal government, simply because a lot of the migrant workers, they come in and at first their children are not documented. So this is where I, I talked about statistics are very important because we need to make sure we have the register of children so that we know that the children will not be exploited, they will not, be, they will not slip through our, uh, you know, through gaps um, and, and, uh, and face this issue of exploitation. So once we have this register, we'll be able to share this with the Humana schools, make sure that they go to schools and then to also make sure that we can help them to get documented, you know, to get the necessary papers so that they are formally in, this, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in our estates. So these are the steps that it's really important. I mean, it's very basic, but very, very important because children is not just, it's a jurisdictional issue. And I think uh, one of the things that I was, I was very, very happy about is the uh, Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil uh, certification because that is a government mandated, mandated certification. And one of the things that we have to make sure is that the uh, issue of child labor, issue of uh, forced labor is being addressed. And this can be addressed not just within our plantation, but across the industry sector. So I think that that is a very um, uh, positive step forward that I see that the government is doing. And we have been sitting very closely with the Malaysian Palm Oil uh, uh, Council um, to make sure that the, any elements, they're doing, they're undergoing revision, that the elements of child labor will be addressed more fully. Nina? Yeah, th um, I just want to sort of reinforce what both Andrew and uh, Srinas has said, because it is about sort of understanding that you can't do it on your own. And that I think from our perspective, it's also to clarify that we are not expecting any, all companies, no matter size, to be experts on child labor, education, family policies, uh, marketing, and so on in, in these areas. It's not necessarily something that you have the resources or sort of the capacity to do. And then partnering up with others who do have that and, and pooling resources is a very efficient way of, of solving these issues. So that's sort of why we, we're trying to sort of hammer that home because we do see it as a very important tool uh, for companies, especially the ones that may not be the largest or have the most resources at their hands. 
or have like huge sustainability department. But by using others, you can actually do quite a lot and learn from them uh, and sort of not repeat mistakes. Okay, um, I have another question that I'd like to ask um, Serena and Andrew. Maybe we'll start with Serena this time. Um, we, you, you both have quite complex supply chains. Um, you both have a lot of business partners that you, you work alongside and you've got a big customer base uh, as well. Again, different, different types of customers very much, but you still have, you both have that in, that, that in common. Um, what sort of role do you think you should be playing in pushing these child rights issues along the supply chain, along the value chain, and, and with, your, with your business partners? Well, that's a great question because it is a, one of the most difficult questions because this is not within our control. So it's all about collaboration. It's all about lessons learned and lessons shared. So the way we do is this, we, we discuss with our, for example, we have the Malaysian Palm Oil Association, where we discuss our, our, uh, uh, you know, our uh, practices, our best management practices with our compatriots so that they will also know how to approach issues that we have already been facing. Um, it is always easy, of course, with the larger companies as opposed to the smaller ones. And this is where we work together with, say, for example, uh, smaller companies and share with them some of the, our resources in order for them to uh, be able to understand and uh, know how to approach issues like this. And uh, to this end, we have what we call uh, um, uh, tools for transformation, whereby we go to our suppliers, for example, explain to them our policies, how we approach them, and also to help them whenever they have any issues facing this sort of issue, uh, facing child labor, for example. Um, in terms of looking at... Uh, <coughs> Our other stakeholders, like our business partners, for example, this is where we work together to do studies, for example. Um, uh, one of the things that we have done, uh, we are going to be doing is um, uh, looking at verification of children uh, in our plantation. Um, verification of uh, how to do this best in terms of ensuring that children are not exploited and um, uh, you know, having what we call consultative forum <laughs> to, to address this issue. Excuse me. I think I'm done here. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> Should I jump in or? Sure. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> uh, I think a couple of things. One, you know, when I look at our customers, uh, we do try and raise a lot of awareness with uh, primarily the parents and the, you know, the families that are the ones subscribing. And you know, in locations, sometimes if I take Australia as an example, when we enter a new regional market where we first put up base stations and things like that, on the one hand, it's quite easy to just go out and sell the service, right? and promote it and market it. But we actually introduce our digital citizenship programs into the local communities that attracts both the schools, the parents, so that you know, with the service also comes the knowledge and awareness of risks and what knowledge they need to do and give them access to tools that parents, for example, or teachers can help uh, the kids with. Uh, one very uh, effective area that we've found and uh, Richard Masai, I, I learned that from you, is we host small groups of what we call business roundtables, where we bring diverse stakeholders together. They could represent the government, the regulator, other corporates uh, in the, the partnerships, as well as the, the non-profit organizations. And by sometimes focusing on topics, sharing the research, it actually stimulates the conversations to find where the collective opportunities are. And in fact, many of our collaborations have come out from this roundtables, uh, diverse roundtables. If there's one area I must say we uh, do have a lot more work to do is in our supply chain. While we do quite a lot of direct engagements with our direct suppliers, uh, you know, clear what our code of conduct is, uh, and we undertake uh, supplier self-assessments, etc. Uh, we also recognize we've got many layers in our supply chain, a lot deeper that we haven't yet necessarily reached 
to do the, the next level of detail, due diligence. So I'll say while we are working directly with our suppliers, we are still quite dependent on them. And uh, there might be issues they're not disclosing or not sharing or may not have the policies. And hence, that's, that's probably the area that for us needs a lot more work. Uh, what we try and do to overcome some of that is we start to plug into a lot more global databases on children rights, human rights, etc., so that we can also get a bit of independent third party views from other types of research on where the issues and the risks are in the nature of our, our tele telecom supply chain. Okay, and Andrew, I want to put you on the spot and ask you a question coming from the audience. And, and you, you sort of started talking about this already a little bit. Um, but the question was, can you reflect on the greatest positive impact that Singtel can have on children? I think the greatest positive impact, the, the future is digital, right? And in a sense, uh, the generation of, of kids growing up are actually first digital natives before they are any form of a native to, to culture, state, territory, or anything like that. So when you think of being able to tackle the issue of awareness, knowledge, acumen, responsibility, skills, very early on, actually, I think that has a very big shaping positive impact for the rest of their lives. In a sense, I always believe you get it wrong at childhood, you can get it wrong for the rest of their life. So going very early in the kind of programs that we do, getting them access, digital inclusion, knowledge, skills, etc., I think has a very lifelong impact, whether they go on to school, they go on to be decision makers, etc., customers, etc. So I think there's a long tail positive benefit going on early and tackling at the stage of, of being a child. Okay, thank you. Um, inevitably, we have a couple of questions around COVID-19. Um, one, I think, specifically for you, Nina, which is, is the survey in any way take into account the COVID-19 uh, situation? And then maybe uh, for Serena and Andrew, if you could just reflect on some of those challenges connecting COVID-19 with, with child rights and any experiences you have. But let's start with you, Nina. Did, did the survey take COVID-19 into account? Thanks, Rich. Yeah, it's a really great question. And um, unfortunately, the actual benchmark, as it handles uh, reports that was for 2000, um, sort of published within 2020, they're not really picking up on this. Companies have not, have not had the time to start reporting on it. Uh, we have found some sort of tidbits on websites and such, but we stopped data gathering in June. So we haven't been able to capture that uh, very well within sort of the, the data collection part. But we, we did want to address this issue though, because you can't really not do it. Um, so we, we partnered with, with Elevate and uh, put out a separate report sort of looking at how have children been affected by COVID in the region and it's being co-published now with, with the benchmark report to sort of give that perspective even if we don't have the specific data. Um, but it would be really interesting to hear from Serena and, and Andrew more about sort of the concrete challenges uh, that they've had in relation to this because we do hear a lot uh, about what companies are doing at the moment around sort of getting access to education, healthcare, sort of kids that stay at home are out of school and so on. Yeah. In fact, Serena, it's quite interesting. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Andrew, you go on. Oh, no, Dr. Okay. Serena, please go. <laughs> I got very excited. Um, well, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, we, we actually see a direct impact on uh, our COVID-19 um, COVID because there are several programs that we wanted to implement which we couldn't. Uh, one specific program that we wanted to do was what we call the after school program that we wanted to introduce into our plantation because we were also worried that after school, the children might also still migrate and play around in the plantation. But it, was, uh, but it required collaboration. We were working with UNICEF to see whether or not uh, UNICEF could provide us some programs and do some training to our teachers uh, and, and that couldn't, couldn't be done because it was difficult to get the teachers in because the teachers are actually from the, the plantation itself. Uh, it was difficult to organize it. So that, that in itself, that program has been shelved. But I think more importantly, we felt that uh, the pandemic does uh, affect 
uh, the children because uh, there's a huge learning gap because of the um, uh, you know COVID nineteen. As you know, a lot of the uh, you know edu uh, you know schools and learning centers have been closed because of the um, uh, you know COVID nineteen, and this affects especially those of our migrant children of our migrant workers. So we thought that one of the things that we, we think that would be important to counter uh, child labor and even trafficking, because, you know, when you have children who are not, um, you know, uh, they are out of boredom, they might do things that, you know, can get them into a position of exploitation. We thought that the, one of the best ways to do is to introduce educational platform. So this, this various educational platform could be done either online or it could be done through specific software program. Because uh, if you are aware, our estates are, you know, in very rural area where, you know, access to Wi-Fi and that sort of thing is not as good. So we want to make sure that we introduce this kind of program because we felt that it, with education as well as awareness to tell them, to tell the children about their rights, uh, about uh, what are the missing educational uh, subjects um, that could help them to um, understand, uh, you know, there are certain things that they, they should have the right and that what are their rights and how to counter um, this issue of exploitation. So I think it's not just about education, it's also about awareness. So not just awareness to the parents, but awareness to the children themselves, to give them uh, uh, understanding of what is exploitation, to, to give them understanding of what is, um, uh, you know, what is it that would cause them to be in a position of being exploited. So these are all the things that we thought would be interesting to, to, count, to, to be put in place to counter this issue of child labor and uh, including trafficking. Andrew? Yeah, I got very excited yeah. because, you know, COVID actually created a lot of challenges, but it turned out that many of the programs that we were running uh, turned out to be even more relevant. I'll give you an example, uh, you know, when schools get shut down and children get sent home and they have to study from home, guess what? Many families don't have internet access. Uh, can't afford internet access. So uh, as an example, we happen to have launched a program, this was in Australia called uh, Donate Your Data, Optus Donate Your Data, where we, in December, and this was before COVID hit, we started to get customers to donate unused data from their mobile plans. And then as a company, we would match them and then work through non-profit organizations to get uh, digital access and inclusion out to vulnerable kids or families from low income. And as we ran that program and COVID hit, there was such a surge in demand from charities and non-profit organizations that it just allowed us to ramp up the program so significantly and engage our customers into the process of enabling uh, digital access for other customers or not even customers. That's one example. Um, because of everything going virtual with COVID, uh, it actually meant that there was a lot more time spent digitally and a lot more risk of things like phishing, scams, and uh, uh, cyber grooming, and so forth. And that actually made our digital citizenship online safety programs even more relevant for schools and for parents. And a third example, uh, you know, in, in the COVID environment, there was a lot of what we call the physical separation, right? Kids at home and you can't get, get access to social support and things like that. And we run a regional program called the Singhealth Future Makers Program, where we work with tech startups developing digital applications or innovations in remote learning, in things like uh, digital domestic violence protection, uh, or even health care related digital solutions. And uh, when COVID hit, it just became so much more an imperative that there had to be some form of a digital solution to solve for this social isolation uh, that happened. Because like domestic violence, for example, we had worked with a tech company to develop smart watches and devices that could uh, uh, alert different stakeholders when a do domestic violence situation was happening. And when you have families under stress in lockdown, actually domestic violence actually went up in many households, right? Uh, that's an example. And uh, health, for example, we had 
kids that you know couldn't go and see the doctors or couldn't be visited. Uh, we had IoT devices that were monitoring, for example, children with asthma uh, to be able to do early detection. And this allowed healthcare workers or the parents to be able to intervene a lot earlier, whereas in a situation where you can't get healthcare workers out, actually it's a life risk to some of these individuals. So the whole digitization and digital capability that we started quite a bit of work to and turned out to be so relevant, so timely, even if it wasn't intended for a COVID type environment. Okay, let me let me ask you to um, uh, one question and ask for a short response because we're getting short of time. Um, but uh, there's a question from someone that basically said, you know, the two of you are now very much seen as leaders uh, in this field. Um, what has been the benefit of being perceived as a leader? I mean, has it has it increased your bonuses, um, or, or um, perhaps more seriously, has it in, has it enabled a dialogue with like investors or shareholders or the financial community. What is the benefit of being seen as a leader? Andrew, let's stick with you first. Sure. Well, I think now the report has just been published. So, you know, I think our stakeholders haven't seen it. But one of the things I think it will stimulate and generate is even more collaboration. Because, you know, we already hold roundtables, we try and play a leadership role. And perhaps a report like that does incentivize better collaboration. People see the positive outcomes of the collaboration. And it's actually not just recognition of Singtel, but in turn, it gives us the ability to go and recognize all the partners uh, across the different stakeholders that we've been able to collaborate with. And I think, you know, there are more successes, there's more recognition. It will just stimulate more collaboration, which means the collective impact is going to be a lot greater. Serena? Okay, so for us, um, the, the, the first benefit is our employees also. They are more settled, they are more satisfied because your children, especially the, those in the plantations, are being taken care of. Uh, you know, not only in terms of the education, but we also provide medical health. Um, we also provide them, um, you know, with the facilities to transport their kids. So I think it gives them a more, um, you know, happier, uh, you know, and, and stable solution. And to us, that's the first thing. Because for us, uh, you know, we as, uh, as a labor intensive um, uh, um, uh, sector, we need to make sure that our employees comes first. And that was the first thing for us. Um, and, and, and of course, the, 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 the domino effect is that, um, you know, uh, Global Child Forum, for example, you know, interviewed us and uh, gave us good, you know, uh, good ratings on, on our practices. That in itself also is a, is a positive, it's a side effect. But for us, our direct impact is on the stability of our workers. You know, we believe that a happy worker is, is a good worker. So, um, and I think, it, you know, it all begins in the family. So that's, that's the, main, the main benefit for us. Okay, one, one quick question for all three of you, again, from the audience. How do you see the relationship between children's rights and human rights? Is, is one a subset of other? Is, is child, children's rights much bigger than human rights? Is it like a Venn diagram? Um, Nina, let's start with you. How, how do you guys see that relationship between children's rights and human rights? Sure. Uh, the Venn diagram, I don't know about, but uh, <laughs> we um, I usually say that sort of children are humans as well. So all human rights are children's rights, right? Uh, so anything that is human rights also applies to children, um, except for perhaps voting rights in some circumstances. Um, but then on top of that, you have children's rights, which are actually an addendum. So children have more rights than adults. And it's both about protection, because children are more vulnerable in many ways. They're still in development. Uh, they're more sensitive um, because of that and need protection. But they also have rights to be seen as people on their own. They have rights to be part of decisions about themselves. Um, and they have right to sort of become people as well. Uh, so they're, they're not only becomings that need to be protected, but they are also people in themselves that need to be listened to and taken into account because of who they are, not who they will become in the future. 
Andrew, Serena, how do you how do you see that sort of human rights, children's rights relationship? Well, I do see it as a Venn diagram. I think there are some elements that are universal principles uh, that apply should apply to every segment, uh, not just children, but persons with disabilities, etc. In terms of vulnerabilities, uh, I think there are benefits and opportunities if we also give children a particular focus you know not just from a rights and protection which definitely like nina mentioned uh, they're more vulnerable they need an added lens to the risks and the issues but i actually think again because of their sort of the future there are actually a lot more opportunities if we don't just look at it from a risk lens which sometimes uh, companies can just focus on the risk element and miss out what could be the opportunities you know and just some of the innovations i shared we would never have thought about it because sometimes we're just looking at it from a risk lens, but some of these entrepreneurs that we work with and founders actually found innovation opportunities that we would never have thought about. So um, I, I look at it from the lens of a mother. Um, you know, uh, to me, human rights, uh, children are humans, as uh, Nina said. But uh, more than that, I think children are the future. And therefore, it's not about just their rights, but how to protect them, how to guide them. And I think if we do them right, you know, they will be what we want to be or what, what we aim to be always, you know, to be better, to be, to have uh, a better life, to have uh, better opportunities, to have the way that we want to live our lives. So I think, you know, it's not just, it's, it's intrinsic in us as humans. And if we take that as it, you know, we don't have to separate between human rights and children's rights. This is their right, you know. As you say, they will grow up to be grown-ups. And they yeah. will be the one to, to pass on, uh, you know, values that, you know, that has been given to them. So I think it's important for us to recognize that. And therefore, it's not just about rights. It's about uh, guidance, about protection, and also to make sure that you know, they have all the opportunities that we want them to have. And one of the rights that somebody has mentioned is the right to education. And, and Serena, you, you, already, you already talked about this, that you know, what's really important um, around plantation communities is, is education and making children go to, go to school. But, it's more than that, isn't it? Because it's about quality education as well. And we, we know that one of the factors that leads children to stop going to school is because the education is rubbish and, 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 and the teachers are not very good. So I, I just wonder how we can, how we can um, make sure we can push quality education. And I wonder from you, Andrew, whether you know, technology and the internet and mobile technology has a role in quality education too. Serena, let's start with you. Oh, me? Oh, okay. So that's, uh, I mean, I, I totally believe in education because um, a lot of times education enables them to lift themselves out of poverty, out of the, 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 the you know, the, the problems that they are facing because now they understand, they are aware of what are the opportunities. And you're right. It's, it's not just about that. Yeah, we have schools but it should be quality schools. And in that sense, and that's why we are working now with uh, uh, UNICEF, for example, because we, we thought that since our children are not just from Malaysia, they're also from Philippines, they're also from, uh, you know, from uh, Indonesia. It, therefore, they need to have more of a global approach. And therefore, their standards could be maybe the same as uh, you know, all the other countries that are developed. Um, so, for, for that matter, then we, we have been looking and asking them to see whether we can train out the teachers. Um, because there are, for example, uh, dependents within our plantation who has no job, and we want to give opportunity to these dependents to be teachers, for example. So, they need training, and they need good training, not just, you know, uh, you know a certificate, but a good training that follows the, the, re the requirements that would ensure that the children will be educated uh, in, a quality, in a quality way. Well, for the Singtel group, uh, you know, just to build on the point of education, in fact, in fact our community uh, pillars are built across three focal areas, digital citizenship and online safety, uh, inclusion and well-being. 
And the third pillar of our focus is education leading to employability for vulnerable youth. And again, you know, reason why we think that is so important is because you get that right in a way as uh, children get better education, they get employment. Uh, at the end of the day, actually we benefit because that's growth in income, GDP, etc. And as, as a business, we actually would benefit from that. So I call that the shared value. If you tackle it early, we actually realize that value over the longer term. And just to the point of, of digital and education, uh, give an example, one of our future makers, which is an Indonesian base called Soft Education, uh, developed a mobile learning, gaming learning app, right? That is meant to address kids who are dropping out of school or uh, can't afford education or parents can't afford education and is taking them out from schools. Uh, something to work on farms and things like that. And it's a mobile learning app that allows children to really be excited about learning, to assess their skills, their knowledge, teach them English, teach them maths. And subsequently, the app gets used in order to assess as they grow up uh, some of the employability skills, which employers also use to assess uh, youth and teenagers as they are looking for employment. So, you know, the role of digital and AI learning and things like that is actually quite powerful. But again, we've got to be able to drive it in a way that it creates a positive impact because sometimes it could also have some of its unintended negative consequences. So again, as a business, we've got to be mindful of both the, the pros of digital and learning and some of the cons that comes with it to be able to tackle the risks. We're coming close to the end now um, and, I, and I'm just reflecting on the fact that we're seeing a lot of progress and hearing the two of you today talk about your companies is very, very positive. I, I mean, just five years ago, I was talking to companies about ch ch children's rights and they just basically thought that was nothing to do with them. Um, just as 20 years ago, a lot of companies thought environment had nothing to do with them and they just had a right to pollute anywhere they wanted to. So we're seeing progress. But I mean, again, I, I go back to the fact that we're seeing some companies doing great stuff. We're seeing a long tail of companies not doing, not doing very much. So my, my final question is really for you, Nina. Um, so for that long tail of companies who've not really started thinking much about, human, uh, sorry, about children's rights uh, uh, yet, what, what recommendations, what advice would you give to those companies who, okay, they're not doing much, but they want to start doing something and they want to start improving on their engagement with children's rights. That's a great final question, Richard. Thank you for that. And I think it's, um, first of all, sort of, you can, when we talk to companies like Singtel and Iowa, you see that sort of doing well on children's rights is not a sort of lost business. You actually gain uh, advantages and maybe not always monetary, but in terms of cultural values and pride in the company and sort of feeling that you're contributing to society, definitely. And you're not losing money on it generally either. So it, it's, that's sort of the first that there is no argument for not doing it. Um, and secondly, I think we, we as an organization, we focus a lot on both sort of highlighting these good examples that others can take after and sort of understand and, and learn from but also more concrete guidance uh, on how to get started. So our website is full of different guidance and toolkits. And in just a few days, we're actually going to launch a digital tool where you can assess sort of what your gaps are and where you can start and get very concrete examples of others that have done the same. So I encourage you to sort of check out our website and we also link to other organizations that have resources. And for those companies that are doing well and want to share their experience, we also have a communications kit on the website. And I know it's going to be sent out via email as well after this to all the companies that participated. So shout about it and <clears throat> let others know that, that you're doing well and have them follow you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nina. I'm afraid we're right up against the time uh, uh, now. So I'm just going to say thank you very much to our friends at the Global Child Forum. 
uh, particularly Nina, of course, but also thank you to Alexis from uh, the Boston Consulting Group for uh, sharing some of the uh, results and methodology. And particularly thank you, uh, Andrew, and thank you, uh, Serena, for spending an hour and a half of your time, uh, your time with us. It's much, uh, much appreciated. And I'm sure people really sort of benefited from hearing some of your practical insights from two very different industries, but hearing your, your practical insights on how to engage with children's rights and also the benefits of that engagement with, with children's rights as well. And I just hope that encourages companies to do more, and I hope it encourages companies who are joining us this afternoon to spread the word and, and encourage other businesses to do more, because I think uh, when we work together, we'll always achieve a lot more than uh, working on our own. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you for those of you listening in. Uh, uh, good evening from Hong Kong and have a nice rest of the day, those of you who are in Europe. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.